So we're gonna move to questions now and I'll encourage you to keep adding them to the chat. And when I call on you, if you're comfortable to unmute and ask your question out loud, that makes it more interactive. So I think the first one that we had was uh, from Darcy about the age. Yeah, I was just curious what, I mean, my son is, he'll be nine this summer and we did some constraint, oh, when he was, maybe two or like 18 months, but haven't done it since. Uh, no, we did one other, one other session when he was about four. I just wondered what um, it looked like for older kids. So I can speak to that a little bit. My daughter went to constraint therapy camps when she was seven and eight. She's Mia, who was in several of the videos. So she did uh, home-based constraint therapy when she was 12 months to two and a half years old. And then when she was seven, she actually found one of her old casts and started playing with it and, and asked me to find her a camp. And, um, and she went one summer, then following February, that's actually where we met Christina. And then the following summer for two weeks, she was highly motivated. She's an athlete. She was playing ice hockey goalie and had a goal of figuring out how to open and close the mitt that her hand went in. And so we sent her to camp with that mitt and bean bags and, and it was very um, directed by her interests and motivation. So I think there's, uh, it originated with adults. I don't think there's an age limit. Maybe the OTs wanna chime in. <laughs> I would say that, um... A nine-year-old's a great, great age because he can kind of come together with some specific goals he wants to work on himself, right? If it, you know, Mar just gave the great example that Mia wanted to work on how to like open and close the timing of opening and closing her mitt. So thinking about that specific goal in mind and kind of scaling it back, okay, where do we begin? Is it, are we working on just the strength to be able to get our fingers um, to sustain in that mitt, or are we working on the range of motion to get our hand up to get to the ball in time? Um, so I think, you know, like Mara said, CIMT did start with adults. So um, he's at a great age to kind of problem solve what's something that he wants to accomplish and then kind of going into that motivational piece. Christina, do you think you could talk about when you would start it as well, just to look at the other side of age? Like at the um, like earlier Earliest side? you would think about, yeah. Um, I would think, you know, the study starts at eight months, which I think of what's an eight month old doing with their hands. They've just kind of figured out how to pick up an object and play with it and bring it to the other hand. So I think that's kind of a nice natural way to integrate it and just kind of start bridging that use of the two hands as well as kind of giving similar stimulation um, that your child would naturally be experienced just due to their age and development. The next question I see is from Pat. Pat, are you available to, to ask your question? So I'm gonna read that question. If, if you're here, Pat, you can um, elaborate. If a child's involved, on, I guess, on the left and the right side, would you still consider constraint? I think you'd have to consider the, the function of what your, your goal is. Um, you know, if you're seeing, I think that's a, a, a great question about what your goal is and if we're looking to kind of if they're showing similar skills then how we might advance one over the other um so i think it's i think it's worth a, a try but i would consider to thinking about what um what you'd like to get out of it claire are you on to ask your question yes thank you mara um, hi, my name is uh, Claire Thomas and I have a daughter. She's uh, two and a half years old now. 
um, and she's going to be three by by summertime. And I was wondering what's the best way for us to find resources um, for group sessions or so, because we've done a couple of constraints and it's been a great game changer. Um, I would definitely advocate for all every parents to just try it out. It is hard initially, but pretty much the first day or the second day is the hardest, but then they are troopers. They see the benefit and you know they continue to use it. I was I was just trying to see what is a um, you know for the next level if she sees other kids similar age to do it maybe she's more motivated and what would be the best way for us to find such resource. Um, and uh, you're in um, uh, uh, Belmont here, so mm -hmm. our, ours is Boston Children's. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, you're right. I mean, three-year-olds, three-year-olds, they want to see what other kids are doing, and it would be great to be around other children who are kind of working on some same skills. Um, so a camp would be a great next step for her. Uh, Mara, you could, if you could help out with that one, what they're doing over in Wellesley would be great to know. Yeah. So Boston Ability Center, which is in, has locations in Natick and Wellesley, they have run. Um, they, when Mia did it, it was a camp there. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know that they do a full on um, CIMT camp. Their camp is more called like intensives and it's customized per child. So they, they have like PT and OT for each child. And then they're more camp activities like the, the third and fourth hour of the morning. So okay. I, I, that's one that I would definitely check out because they're doing intensives and they have experience with, with constraints induced movement therapy. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, nice to see you. Yeah, okay. nice to see you. Um, Judy, you're asking about active toddlers. Can you ask your question? Hi, um, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. Um, so a rural model, um, uh, we, our state is not yet allowing in person. I do early intervention zero to three. Um, I have just acquired two two-year-olds, incredibly independent. Don't tell me what to do. I'm gonna play basketball. I'm gonna walk horribly and, but they've never, like they don't even have a diagnosis. Uh, you know, uh, they've not had a CT or whatever to diagnose them. So any ideas to, um, you know, you're kind of dealing with the terrible twos, uh, independent and how any specific ideas I would uh, appreciate. And also, um, you know, sort of with the distance, um, you know, uh, all, all virtual sort of stuff. Thank you. Um, so I have, and so they've never done constraint before and they're still like sorting out like the diagnosis. Okay, okay. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, and you're still in virtual. Virtual is, um, we're all working hard to be creative in that arena, even still a year later. Um, I would go back to, you know, I would start with a little bit of that, that sensory piece for that two-year-old, right? Um, even if we're not gonna do constraint, just to see what they'll do with two hands, just to start from there. Um, because two-year-olds, they want to be messy. They want to explore, even through virtual, even if you're just thinking about, um, you know, talking with the parent ahead of time of what materials they could have available, whether we're doing like a little car wash for our cars or with, so we've got some shaving cream and we've got water or we're giving our doll a bath or anything like that. Um, you know, so we've got sponges and we've got towels. And I would start there. Um, just to see how they'll just kind of mix it up and see if there's a little bit of that sensory piece that helps hold their attention a little bit longer. Um, and then I might start to move to say like, all right, let's take turns. Like first lefty goes and then righty goes. Lefty holds the towel, righty holds the doll and see how we can integrate using two hands there. Then that might give you a better sense of what's, you know, how they'll tolerate or what they'll do with that involved hand. Um, and then maybe we start to progress towards like, okay, just righty's gonna hold the towel. Um, before we do any sort of hard constraint, 
I, I would be hesitant to start something like that over Zoom until you could see them in person. And I would do a little bit more of the natural ones, like hide this one in your pocket or hide your, your shirt in your sleeve. Um, or like, can you uh, lie down on your side and reach up with your, with your other hand? Um, and then once you kind of moved, if when possible, moving into in-person, then I would start to explore what that more um, longer term, by longer term, I just means more hours in the day of what that hard constraint could look like. No problem. Thanks. Giselle, would you like to describe your your son, your child? And I think Brian might might be good to field this one. They're writing, they're speaking in English. Sorry, I'm from Paraguay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and it's basically that the question that I put over there. He just keeping going background. We did the restriction. We did everything that you just saw over there, you shown over there. And he's very uh, ambidiestro, bilagra. So, and he's good. But at, as soon as you stop stimulating him, he start like uh, with the miparicia, bending his arm. And like, uh, I don't know how to say, rengar, sorry. <laughs> Someone who can talk later for me. And start walking like this. Just a little bit. I noticed because I am a mother. And anyone else, even my husband said, oh, you're too, you're getting you got worried. And you know, and he's just walking like that because he wants to be you know, older, but it's not like that. And he's doing, uh, uh, he's swimming now in swimming classes. He did basketball, he used both, but he keeps preferring uh, the good side, which is his left. And for example, if, He's walking through a hallway and the, the light switches on his uh, right, he will turn with him to, to, to do it with him left. And when something, things like that. Mm -hmm. So what, what should I continue mm -hmm. stimulating? The doctor saying in here that he's good and he would only has to do sports, but I don't know, I'm not sure about it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it, it's a, a great description. One of the things I do talk to families about is regardless of how much therapy and everything we do, we're, we're never going to make that weaker hand their dominant hand. They're, they're going to continue to use, despite as much therapy as we do, that, that dominant hand is going to be their dominant hand and, and they're going to be better with it. And sometimes it's hard if they don't have to use two hands to get them to, to use that weaker hand as they go through. I think a lot of times my goals, depending on, on the child and depending on the level of function that they're at, is to really make it so it's not a thought when they try to use it as a helper hand, when they, when they need by manual their, um, use of their hands, that they don't think twice about it. They use that other hand and they're able to hold the paper down or pick things up that are larger. Or you know, one of the videos I think Christina showed, they, they passed the block over to, to the weaker hand and then picked it up with their better hand. So they were able to, to do that more fine motor control with their better hand. And, and it was very natural. It was very something that, that came to them instinctually from the therapy, you know, of, of kind of working through those grease, those grooves and making it something that, that was kind of ingrained. Um, so, you know, I think that the, the light switch is a hard one because realistically it's going to be something that's hard to, to teach him because it doesn't really get in the way of his, of his life, right? It's an extra second. It's not the most efficient way, but at the end of the day, it's not going to change things. You know, I things that I think about when I see kids continuing to have restriction. Um, one, I think the idea of using sports and that sort of thing is fantastic. However, I will say that using somebody that's um, adept with adaptive sports is often um, a great adjunct to to the regular sports. You know, swimming I think is a good example of this. Often. When we he see gets less coaches. frustrated also. Sorry. Because different, he let he gets less frustrated. What I I I uh, where I can explain the person who's going to cheat him, mm -hmm. and I have to explain what the difficulties are and everything. Here is very different. Yeah, than, I think in, it's in the United States. It's hard for yes. me to speak. So to he, he gets resources. less frustrated when when the person has a different uh, way to see him and focus on him. Mm -hmm. And 
not making difference because sometimes he's in a group, sometimes he's by himself. Right. Um, and being in a group is also good for him. Yep. Yeah. And, and I so think that, that kind of things. A hundred percent. The one thing I, that I do like when we talk to adaptive coaches is that they teach the children how to use that hand in in swimming or how to how to make the most of it versus how to work around it which is what we often see in some of the more general coaches is that they're teaching them how to do everything without having to use that hand versus how to maximize and and mara you might be able to speak to some of this with with mia and and what went on because i think that that's an important part especially if that's kind of the resources that you have available is maybe working with the coaches to maximize the use of that hand and that leg versus trying to work around it. So I'll just say, um, we all are dominantly handed except those of us who are like really ambidextrous. So Mia plays ice hockey goalie, she's almost 12 and, and she chose to hold the stick in her stronger left hand because that's the thing that she uses more often in that sport. And over time, she's just put the mid on over and over again. And she, um, uh, you know, sort of proud mom moment this past Sunday, she played in the semifinals for her um, end of season play for ice hockey. And she made a glove save. The puck hit, hit her glove. She didn't catch it but it hit the glove, deflected out, and she, her team, which I also helped coach, we won four to zero, and she was so proud. She's been working on glove saves at every practice this season. So that's the other thing that I would say to you, Giselle, with children, once they get to be eight, nine, 10, and older, if you can find something that's intrinsically motivating to them, um, she, Mia has recently taught me that the shape of her hand has changed just by wearing that mitt because she has to hold it up and the, it's a heavy leather glove and it pulls the thumb out and it opens the web space and she's doing something she loves. So there's sort of like a built-in positive reinforcement from that, but that's you know an activity she, she gravitated towards. So I'm gonna just circle back to the questions. Anna, thank you you, yeah, thank you, Giselle. Anna, can you um, share your question and also how old your child is? Because I think that'll be helpful. Yes, it is exciting. Period. It is even more exciting after the second one plus 14 more days. Um, Mary, I'm not sure if you mean to be talking to us. I'm calling Period. on Good. Anna, are you still here? So let's let's try yes, to answer. Oh, good. You mean Anna Harper? Yes, Anna. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Hi, um, and hi, Mary Rebecca and Dory. Um, yes, my question is: um, Corbin is almost he's five and a half. We have done. Um, both studies of Virginia Tech uh, a couple years ago. Um, he has done since then, he's been involved in eight CIMTs <clears throat> at different places. Uh, my question is, he's doing amazing. I mean, he now he has developed the pointer, the pincher. We are working on the e-hand manipulation. Um, but when it comes, when the cast comes down, um, he just forgets about that hand. I mean, he goes down, he plays the left hand, the affected hand just goes fisted behind his back. So I don't see that simul like spontaneous voluntary movement um, unless he needs it to, to do something as a helper hand um, where it's necessary to use two hands. Um, so my question is, when do we move from CIMT to bimanual? Um, and um, yeah, this I guess this is my question. When do we stop and focus on the bimanual uh, intensives? Thank you. Uh, that's a great question, Anna. Uh, can you give me an example of something that he will use two hands for? Because it sounds like initially he brings his hand, keeps his left hand down. Um, and it will only use it unless he really needs it. 
Yes. Yeah, so um, say he's playing. Um, he's playing on the floor uh, with his toys, with his cars. That's what he usually does. And his that's not when I'm talking about when we are not doing therapy, when not when I'm not telling him, hey, use your left hand. Um, then he will use only his right hand. Um, his left hand will go behind. Now, if he needs, for example, he would use a bigger truck uh, uh, and he needs to hold the truck down so he can put the other uh, monster truck on top. That's when I see the left hand comes in and helps it and he uses both hands. Well, I think that's fantastic that he recognized that I've got to carry something big and therefore I need to use two hands. So I think it sounds like he's not naturally doing it until it's actually, until he feels like he really needs it. Um, but I like that he recognized like, this is a really big toy and I need two hands and that's when he'll bring it in. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if when he's like first set up, um, in whatever he's playing with just kind of on his own, if he just starts, if he's starting off with that dominant hand, and then we've got a little bit of that, just kind of that overflow in that left hand. And so we're just got, it's almost like stuck. And so it's, I think, I wonder if the cue to get him started and then backing off and see if it kind of sticks might be one way to go. So true. And I, actually last one he did it we went uh he did a month in uh kennedy krieger um okay. in february and our goal was to work on using um left hand incorporating left hand in like during play making sure that at least is open he doesn't put he because he usually puts his head on the floor on the left side and mm -hmm. kind of back the left arm goes under and back um, mm -hmm. So we are working on, hey, at least put it flat on the floor. Um, and he did amazing, but I mean, it's been a month. And um, if I don't remind him, I still see that that happening, uh, that forgetting that left hand. And it's just, as a parent, I know this is, as Brian said, it, it, this is, he's always gonna have that dominant hand. Um, and uh, we're not trying to make that left hand dominant, but I do want to see that spontaneous use, especially since we've done so much therapy. I feel yeah. like it's, it's great. Okay, we did the pointer. Okay, we did the pincher, but why don't I see that more, more spontaneous use? Is it something that it will eventually come or should we actually focus on by manual? Is this, is that part we are missing? Are we missing on that part now? So um, I want to actually chime in on that just as a parent, because that we did sort of back and forth between constraint and by manual always from when Mia was very young. So I was always like looking for things that she could swing on with her arms, things that she could climb, like rock climbing, um, riding a scooter, riding a bicycle. So things, again, that are intrinsically motivating, that are fun for the child, that just naturally demand two hands. Bigger toys, like it's getting to be warmer, pick things you can pick up with two hands, a wheelbarrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So any of those things that like naturally require two hands and you like, even with this, these ideas I've just thrown out, you start to populate the child's life with those things and you'll see, they just do it. I oh, yeah. to, oh, oh, sorry, Christina. Uh, no, you go. <laughs> my name is Lino. I, I joined a little bit late. <laughs> I got another <laughs> commitment today. But I just heard, Anna, a part of the, of, of the issues. And I think I completely echo that it's a kid. The one thing that is not going to help likely is reminding. Because that's not how they are thinking about their hand. And in fact, it, it could even become something that they, they feel distracted. And I think a more subtle approach to uh, maybe Changing the expectation, that's what I'm trying to propose here. The changing the expectation is not, oh, he's not gonna use the hand. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, let him go around the world. And if mostly if he's having fun, <laughs> like he's like enjoying something, it doesn't so much matter how much is, oh, how is he using? And I love the idea that he put the head down. 
uh, so you see it as <laughs> what the hell is that? But it's resource. It, it is resourcing to things to access the world. And that's the most important thing for brain development. Remember that hand is one thing to access the world, but the brain is developing by the lot of other sensory and activities and experiences that the kid is having, including the emotional part of play. Uh, so then populating the environment for things that naturally you cannot do with one hand may be a, a good way to, not, to be very implicit. Um, and I was saying change the expectation in the sense that it's not when you think he should be using the hand that he, he, he has to use the hand, but it's when it's useful to use the hand. And so if you think about usefulness to him and you see him getting away with things and doing okay, it's okay what he's doing. And by manual, it's by use that you really get them to use, to get to, to engage that part. Um, and there are a lot of sports also that will require to start like using and playing with both hands. That could be very helpful also. To also not have to be that parent that it has to always be associated with the therapy part. Like you take them to OT, you practice things at home, you work on specific things, all are wonderful, but you also wanna be the parent that is just really happy to enjoy play with them without having to remind them about anything. That's one kind of conceptual frame. Maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't. So uh, thanks, Patty. I just want to thank Christina because I know she needs to sign off. And there are a couple more questions that I think Patty and Brian and I can help answer. So thanks so much, Christina. Really thank you. appreciate Thank you. Thanks. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks so thanks. much. Bye. Great. Bonnie, are you still here? Yes. <laughs> can, can you ask your question about the integration with um, cognition? Okay, I, it sounds kind of vague. So if you don't mind, Mara, I'm gonna ask in regards to your daughter because you're, you're, what I was hearing, you were describing that she made a stop with the right hand. So the neurological impact was on the left side. And so she detected movement in this field up, up by her head on the right. That's what I got from that stop. So I'm wondering, how does she understand space on the right that's not moving, is moving? How does that, you're doing, how do you think that, okay, I can see you understand. If you can ask, phrase it better, please. Yeah, so I'm happy to answer that question. The question in the chat was sort of the connection about okay, we're, there's all this focus on the affected arm, affected hand, but how does that affect the child's sense of themselves in space, in three-dimensional space that they're moving in, as well as cognition? So playing goalie, you're, you're trying to um, block the ball or the puck, because she plays goalie in soccer also, um, and you have to know where you are relative to the net behind you and, and the field in front of you. And um, she's excellent at that. I think she's better than my neurotypical child at spatial awareness. Um, we have another coach on our team of coaches who, who filmed her this, he, he put, a, he took his phone and he attached it to his, the blade of his hockey stick and filmed her and then had a half hour session showing her when she was out of position. So sometimes she was um, taking too long to get from the right side of the crease back over to the left side. And with just that little bit of instruction, um, the next week in practice, she was doing it better. So I think that there are some really phenomenal tools for coaching now that we can integrate with, with how we're um, approaching these kinds of broader issues of spatial awareness, but that's that's my personal story. And I think we're gonna get more into these themes in the first session we have in May. Um, Maddie Wilkinson and I and Patty Muslino were talking about movement, awareness, and um, learning. So the, the broader concepts of, of cognition connected to movement and awareness. Can, can I say one other thing or, and ask one other? Um, I, 
as I've worked, I've kind of evolved in what I do. I'm very into vision and movement and very into respiration in movement because respiration is the core we work off of, the elusive core everybody seeks. And um, there is so much, I mean, just those videos, there was so much asymmetry. If you have that asymmetry there, you're going to have that asymmetry in respiration, believe it or not. And, um, and so if you could dig that up in your, uh, your talks, I think you would be happy. The other thing is, would you mind my asking, so your daughter, where was her injury? My daughter had a perinatal stroke. It was a left middle cerebral artery stroke, um, large. She was diagnosed at two days old due to seizures. Thank you, thank you, thank I, you I, so I much. Will, I will compliment, so I, I, I hear something else also that is good to remind ourselves, but I'll, I'll compliment on this, um, how the brain maps function. And it does never, ever, ever use a single modality. <laughs> Even when you think it's only visual, it's also using sound and it's using position of the head. Uh, so that's, if you remember that, if you wanna learn something, if you wanna develop, evolve, you will need a multi-sensory experience. So what happens if the stroke damage, and this is it's very particular to the type of stroke, and that's a good question. Where is the stroke? It, it will inform what to expect as a challenge for the kid. If the stroke affects the parietal lobe in any of these sides, but the right side, the most commonly more severe, there is a sense of neglect of sensory input coming from that other side of the world. So if the right side parietal lobe is affected, you would not recognize as so important <laughs> the left side of the world. And this is all very variable because depends on the age of the kid, depends on when the stroke happened, depends on how big the stroke is, and depends on the innate capacity of the kid to heal the, the stroke that it happened. So don't take anything that we're saying in this as a, as a full, like kind of, we're not prescribing things. We're trying to open a dialogue so you guys can think in a different frame to help your kids in the way that you can. But if you were to happen to have less awareness, neglect, or loss of that sensory function, vision, uh, tactile, uh, tactile, even the air coming from one side and the other is being constantly sensed by our bodies to, to get to move around. You could use a resource to sensory that you know is there. And we will talk about this, but a way to complement movement sensory, locomotor sensory information coming into the brain is to look at it. For example, vision to, 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 to proprioceptive. And another way to complement when you are not working with one side is, for example, what Mara was talking about. Take the different angle that the brain would not be able to see to, to give more sensory information. And, and in a way that is enticing to the kid is the most important part, <laughs> mostly if you're working with a young child. Um, and then the, the other part is, you just mentioned that you're working on respirations and stuff. We want to hear from you guys all across wherever you are. If you know of group of experts and therapies or people that have gotten together to validate something that could be helping other people or you receive help from. Because we wanna expand what we are talking in these sessions mm -hmm. to what other people also found helpful. And it might be completely different and we don't know about it. Uh, so we always ask that you connect with us and we will try to see how, first of all, most important, not harmful it is. Second, could it be beneficial? And then is these people that you work with willing to work in this platform uh, will be the next, the third part. But we are welcoming proposals. Uh, so in the survey after this, please, if you have recommendations of someone and you have their contact information or you wanna do an introduction, just let us know where we get we get in touch with you so we can go ahead with those. Thanks. Judy, do you want to ask your question, your helper hand question? And so um, you know, I'm hearing some of the parents of, of older children and seeing the subtleties that still exist. Um, and so it sort of is the goal um, just making sure that that affected some with, um, you know, functional activities. Um, um, 
So is it involved and, and maybe more fluid in its movement? Um, it's not, I mean, is that sort of the goal of constraint? Not that it becomes the dominant hand, but just that it becomes a more natural um, limb? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I can I can tell you if I heard on and off. I don't know if it's my connection or for everybody else. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I've never I never know with Zoom who, who, who has the problem. Um, but what I the the, the aim of constraint constraint induced movement therapy is to enable use of a, a part of the body in this case is the hand that otherwise is not being favored by the economy of the brain. <laughs> so everything is what is kind of the easiest, fastest way to learn to pick up. And remember that the kid is doing so many things that it needs other things to go on at the same time. And one thing that happens, and I don't know how much of this was, was discussed or presented, is that when there is a stroke in one side of the cortex, in the motor system, like the MCA, the cerebral artery strokes, we know now, and even in children of different age, that the area that is damaged, that is trying to work with that hand, is being inhibited by the area that is not damaged because of economy, <laughs> because the connections and the network says, this one is slow or it gets a spastic, but this one is really fast at doing the things that I need to do to eat if I wanna feed myself. So that inhibition of the contralateral hemisphere Okay, across the corpus callosum, this is the white matter structure, has been well demonstrated and is in fact being part of the target of other treatments like TMS, transmagnetic stimulation. And is the principle that also informs that if I can shut down the very easy to use limb, in this case, in my example, my right hand, and if I put it to rest, by not having activation of those neurons that control that, I also lose that inhibition of the affected side. So my nerve cells, my neurons that are able to connect to that hand and move it, you see movement, can do it without inhibition, <laughs> without increased spasticity. And you can guys, you guys can do it yourself. This happens in our brain all the time. If I grab something and squeeze it really hard, try to do something fine with the other hand. It's really tough. Okay, that's contralateral inhibition. <laughs> so, and we supposedly don't have brain injury, <laughs> at least I don't, I'm not aware of right now that I have that. But the whole point is that this is part of how the system is developed. And in development, these things will enhance. That break will become very dominant if there is, an, if there is no opportunity for that affected site to experience, because then it becomes a site that does not experience. And if it doesn't experience, it doesn't develop. So we are now not favoring that possibility. The potential is, is being taken away. Uh, and for everything, again, the balance of um, what I say healthy is what is happening with the emotion of that kid when is, this is happening. Because if it's really stressful, we know the corticosteroids will inhibit learning. So don't do that. <laughs> and, and it's a very difficult balance for any parent parenting to find that boundary between, I put a little bit of a boundary so we can concentrate on a task that it's good that the kid gets engaged in or at least gives it a try. And at the same time, I don't put too much of a boundary that I make it not an enjoyable experience because that will deter the kid from trying to grow in it. Uh, and experience and learn more from it. So dynamic, patience, and again, experiment. <laughs> I think one thing, kids are very resilient. So if you did it wrong, don't worry. There will be time to rearrange and, and learn other things. That's what at least we see, because a lot of things that we used to do in the past, we learned that they're not so helpful. And you see these kids also thriving and getting through. So give yourself also a little bit of slack and experiment. And I just wanna chime in on this and then I think we have one more question. So, you know, overall the goal is a, a functional adult, like that the child grows to be a functional adult who can use as much of themselves as possible to do what they wanna do, to, to live a meaningful, life and contribute to society. 
And so wh whenever there's this like narrow focus on, you know, developing the pincer grasp of the, the affected hand, I try to go back to like, are we inhibiting the spirit of that child? Um, because we, we really want whole people to come out of whatever therapeutic um, regime we're, we're putting them through. So that's, that's sort of the balanced perspective um, with all of this. And I think even more so with constraint. I know when I first started experimenting with constraint, when Mia was 12 months old, I got a lot of family members were talking to me about how it was just, what I was doing was just like when people took left-handed people and forced them to be right-handed. And I had to have those conversations which are not easy with close family members. Um, so I'm gonna ask Brenda to ask her question and then I will, um, I'll put again in the chat, the link to the videos from the past five and you can expect the video from this to be up there as well soon. So Brenda, if you can ask your question. Yeah, um, as I wrote um, on here, my son had a stroke, it was actually HIE when he was born. Um, so he's recently turned 10. So he's had a long history of um, therapies, just multiple um, different kind of modalities over the years. Um, and I think it took me a long time to really notice, really, he's my only child. And it really wasn't until I saw him with other typical kids running. And I realized his running looked different. Um, you know, like the right side looked pretty fluid, but the left, he looked like he was kind of kicking off with his left leg or something. And I've always noticed a very subtle difference um, on his left side. His, his stroke was greater on the right than the left. Um, so I think generally I, you know, tend to, you know, he does a lot of two-handed activities. I give him lots of verbal reminders, particularly when he's eating, you know, he'll, he's also ambidextrous. So he will, you know, he eats with his right hand or he'll use scissors, but he draws and writes with his left hand. Um, he can cross his midline. So I don't think it's just compensatory. I don't know how unusual, I always think it's, he, he also has visual field deficits on his left. So I, and, and uh, worse um, visual acuity on his left. So I always thought when he was really little, there's no way he'll be left-handed, but he actually is, or at least he writes left-handed. Um, and then, as I mentioned, he he also has CVI. So some activities like trying to get into sports has always been difficult because of you know his perception of movement, um, not perceiving fast movement or too much movement. That's difficult for him also to process, or it's too distracting. Or all the other kids, um, his and again his visual field deficits. Um, so some of those other things. Um, are also considerations, but it's it was helpful hearing some of the suggestions around just, you know, kind of building those things into his life. And I think I try to do that, you know, things like Play-Doh, he's really into like tying things. <laughs> so, you know, he'll, he, he will use his hands together, but I think I just sometimes tend to see, I'll notice it like at meal times, which is kind of a downtime and, um, <laughs> you know, trying to get through a meal without saying, you know, use your left hand or use your, help, use your other hand or hold the, bowl, you know, like, scooting the bowl across the table because he's not like holding on to it or you know he's just using his right hand um so it's, it is much more subtle it, it, it isn't um you know uh, it, it, i you know i don't think it would be at all helpful to do something like camt i actually looked at that when he was an infant because i was just you that's what you do in the middle of the night when you have a child who had a stroke when they were born and you research all these things um so I guess, you know, maybe I'm just on the right track and he will always have that. Um, and I, I did like your point about, you know, like focusing on the pins or grasp or versus just looking at the whole child and the whole person. Sounds, Brenda, I take a little bit of the lead and Brian, if you have other thoughts. And I, I have to say, one of the things that I inform my conversations with families is by the MRI, believe it or not, because it, even though, is a picture, it does tell me what kind of connections or things that were supposed to be set up. And I say that because in perinatal uh, injury, a lot of it is not yet completely wired. So they have a lot of flexibility and plasticity to change how the network will end up working. 
So switching one notch of the network for another one because this one is, is more available or has better chances. So very difficult, but it sounds like he had a diffuse injury and also focal areas of injury. That's some, what I'm guessing from your description if I have to localize where the problems were. His was primarily the back of the brain. Um, the occipital lobes were both impacted um, mm -hmm. and then some other areas, I believe the parietal and a handful of areas really. Okay. And it, I was gonna say, it does sound like he has significant posterior involvement because of what you were referring. Uh, of this visual field and that the left side is, is much more impaired, but he also has cortical visual impairment. Uh, coming together to the midline uh, can happen by many different means in the body. Uh, and if you can even experiment with this yourself, if you close your eyes and you try to come together, you will use the sensation of your muscles and your joints, and, and but you would not have that kind of whatever exact point of most of it depends on how fine you want to go into the movement. Uh, but it does rely heavily to develop in visual input. So we had luxury of having the visual input when we were learning how to do things here in the middle of the world, not out there. Uh, and that could be something that he's trying to develop out with alternative ways. And I'm saying is this because it's probably what he's trying to experience. And, and you, can, you, you can see that crossing that midline may be an integration that puts him in a, it may be that going to the other side takes away his sensory feedback that he's using to know how to operate in the center nasal field here. So he is trying to complement with other sensory modalities, how to uh, kind of compensate for the loss of vision input. And it probably would have a very high like sensation and the proprioceptive side of how to do things. So one idea that is coming, and you probably have tried a lot of things, and maybe I'm saying that, is if you want to try different kind of gloves and surfaces, I'm not saying to cover the tip of the fingers, which are very helpful to get tactile, but very thin, not restricting in movement, but giving feedback when he moves extra. So you can use this with these fab different fabrics, like just made, making a um, kind of a winter mitt uh, or hand without covering the tip of the fingers. And see what happens. If this is in one hand, see it's in the other hand. Because sometimes the, the input is just like enhancing that ability that he does have to see if he can get the extra that he needs to get to what he wants to. But if he's feeding and he's enjoying, and it sounds like he's exploring a lot <laughs> with his hands, uh, I'm not so sure that you do really have to go after it. What I'm trying to propose is expand the ability for him to sense things. And you can try anything you want by changing the texture, the size, the weight of what he's working with. Uh, and one of the things when they're feeding that you can try is to give a very favorite things they love to hold. And this is usually food comes first usually, but you can try it. <laughs> and, and give it to the hand that he usually uses for feeding. So it's a little bit easier and see if he engages the other hand, if it's something like that. But I do agree with you that I don't see a, letter, a laterality that is significant enough to be going after it. And there may be another way to do the restrain part, so making that hand busy, or making this extra sensory by giving the, the hand that you think is using less other sensory feedback. I don't know if this is uh, helpful, and Brian, I don't know if you have any other ideas. I think from the upper extremity, that, that is very thorough. Um, you know, in terms of the gait, the subtle stuff, I, I think sometimes it's really hard, especially when it only comes out with activity, uh, when he's running further and it's like a subtle movement, because it can be relatively subtle, you know, weaknesses or tightnesses that are coming out with activity. Um, I think it's, it's often hard to say hundred percent. I do like sometimes some of, you know, things that I recommend to families, if there's, if we notice weakness in the feed and that sort is barefoot walking in the sand where it's really working on, you know, strengthening some of those more intrinsic muscles, because that may be where we see that weakness. It's not those big gross motor muscles that are making the big movements, but more of the positioning muscles. Um, and there, there are subtle things that you can do for those things as well, from bracing to other, other types of interventions. But um, 
you know, often I, I think working on kind of those more subtle, subtle aspects of strength can be helpful for us too. Okay, thank you. So I think we'll wrap up now. I just want to mention that we're coming into our busy season. Our next event is in just three weeks and that's in April and we're focusing on speech and language. And then in May, we have two events. One is about um, movement, awareness and learning. And that's Patty, Maddie and I. And then our second event in, in May, May is Pediatric Stroke Awareness Month is um, Elise, what's Elise's last name? Um, oh. Wolf, okay. is it Elise Wolf? Speaking yes. about exec executive functioning skills and some um, social pragmatics. So we have um, events coming up in the next uh, next two months that are gonna be exciting and our YouTube channel's up and we'll continue adding to it. So thanks everyone for staying and uh, those catching the video. Thank you everybody.